Hello everyone, welcome to Grad Chat by PhD Balance, where we talk about topics of grad school beyond academic research and that may be more difficult to talk about in our day-to-day -day lives. I'm your host, Aiden, and I'm the Digital Media Coordinator for PhD Balance. I'm currently in the process of mastering out of my PhD program in Geological Sciences at the University of Saskatchewan to pursue a different career path. But before going any further, I would like to pay respect and acknowledge that I occupy Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Diné, and Nakota Sioux nations. So if you missed it, we're now pre-recording episodes for release. All episodes are still available via video on our PhD Balance YouTube channel and via audio on all major streaming platforms. And don't forget to subscribe on your chosen flat platform to get notifications about new episodes. So our topic today is job searching without mentorship support. And I'm really excited to welcome our guest, Dr. Daniel Jeffries. Dan received a PhD in chemistry from Vanderbilt University in 2019 after which he did a postdoc at Harvard University. Although he is no longer in a fume hood, he has been able to find a career that keeps him close to the action and involved in his passions. Outside of work, Dan enjoys visiting new breweries, hiking and camping, and spending time with his fiance and cats. So we we're so pleased to have you on Grad Chat, Dan, to discuss your experiences. Awesome, yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and then thank you for the introduction and thank you for the time on the podcast this morning. Of course, thank you for coming. Um, okay, so let's get into the meat and potatoes of this podcast. Um, should you tell your PI, supervisor, mentor that you're actively job hunting when you start? Yeah, that's a very good question and something that I would actually talk about sort of all of the time uh, with my peers. And I think for the uh, duration of this podcast is probably helpful to think about two buckets. One bucket if you're a PhD student, another bucket if you're a postdoc, um, because sort of the, the levers that you can pull and the sort of power that you have that, you know, students might not realize they have is a little different for each situation. So I think starting with the, the grad student bucket, obviously, first and foremost, like the, the degree will come before the job. Um, I know a lot of employers just state of the play today, you know, they're not going to take you before you earn that degree. And that degree could be the PhD, it could be the master's, like you just can't necessarily leave empty handed is what I'm saying. So uh, to that end, and then keeping in mind, of course, this sort of classic power dynamic in grad school where your PI needs to sign off on your thesis, like it can be a little challenging. I would not recommend telling your PI uh, that you're searching for a job as a grad student until you've also had the conversation of like, this is my escape plan, <laughs> as it were, you know, just a very candid conversation as a grad student, like, you know, either look like I'm killing it here. I have a dozen publications. I'm like rocking it. Uh, it's time for me to get my degree and move on or the opposite of like, you know, this isn't what I thought it was. Um, interested in exploring other opportunities. Let's like talk about, you know, getting a, a master's degree or some other uh, um, event that signifies your time was well spent. Um, I definitely don't recommend people, you know, tell their PI that they're getting a job, sort of ghost them and don't get anything for their time in grad school. Um, and so we, we can talk about that more because that is a little vague. I think, you know, the uh, TLDR, as a grad student, you know, the focus needs to be on the degree. As the postdoc, it's a much more sort of dynamic relationship um, and something that I, I really advocate for postdocs across all fields, you know, do need to understand they have a lot of power. And I mean, I would say, you know, day one as a postdoc with your PI, you let your PI know if this is what you want, that you're here for a job. Yeah. Um, because, you know, people do their postdocs after five, six years of grad students, like you're giving this PI, you know, years or months of deferred salary, uh, to put it crass, and also, you know, years of your life where you can be building experience in industry. Um, and there needs to be a contract there where the PI is going to give you something in return. Um, we're going to talk about publication record and letters of references and things like that. But, 
you know, I do take a little more of an aggressive approach and I do want to enable people to feel that they have power, um, which is grad students and postdocs, you know, that's not instilled. <laughs> you know, no one goes around campuses telling grad students and postdocs like they actually have power to make these decisions. Um, and so, yeah, kind of, you know, hope I can be on this podcast today and sort of tell my story, tell the story of my peers um, and show that there is power. So. As a grad student, I would focus on the degree. As the postdoc, I would be career forward. Okay. So yeah, I think that's really important, making sure that you have open communication and being very uh, transparent. Uh, but you did say that you probably wouldn't tell someone um, that you're actively job hunting. And I guess that just retains your power. Um, and I think it's instilled in us as grad students that we have no power, but we really do. And I think that's it's it's really important to remind everyone of that. Um, so you touched a little bit on the differences in in um, moving forward as a grad student versus a postdoc. But um, how does it come to actually job hunting as as either one of these yeah. grad students or postdocs? I do think, you know, so. I come from from STEM, a uh, chemistry degree, and maybe this is different in English or the arts or just areas that I'm not as familiar with. Um, so keep in mind that this is for STEM and then hopefully it's broadly applicable. But as a graduate student, like everyone who enters the job market is sort of PhD um, or master's degrees. You know, there are lots of jobs for bachelors, but there is sort of this um, psychology that where if you enter grad school, people might not want to hire you for a bachelor level job, if that makes sense. Um, and I don't know if that stigma is changing, but that was sort of the stigma when I was looking at this maybe five or six years ago. Um, so just something to keep in mind. And the the way I think about it and the way I encourage other people to think about it is it is just sort of levers that you can pull and positioning for yourself. And the closer you are to PhD or master's, whatever that term or degree is for you, like that's one really big lever to pull. Now I'll just give you a clear example. Like if you're a chemist and you want a job at Pfizer, they're not going to talk to you if you're three years away from getting your PhD. They will talk to you if you're one year away from getting your PhD. And so sort of how do you you know, as a grad student, get comfortable with that timeline before approaching people um, who work at these companies that you want to also work at. Uh, and networking is a huge deal. But it's important to remember, like, um, that terminal degree is the real uh, limiting reagent, if you will, um, just that because, you know, yeah. <laughs> and then as a postdoc, it's a different story and it's a much more exciting story. Because, you know, if you don't want to go into academia, so if you're someone with an advanced degree who is super interested about all the things science can do besides teaching science to someone else, uh, I mean, the postdoc is really your time to flourish. You know, full transparency, um, you know, we receive letters as postdocs where it says a two-year kind of minimum stay, at least that's customary in STEM. That's a lie. Like you, no one needs to stay for those two years if they don't want to. Um, I've seen postdocs leave, find successful positions in as short as three months. Wow. Um, yeah, and then you know those their puts and takes, and this is the part of sort of understanding like the power people have. Um, you know, because you can leave your postdoc in three months, but then the the put is that you're probably gonna piss off if I can say that live um, you know the your PhD advisor and probably the postdoc advisor and in my case there was this funnel right so like my PI would send lots of people to this postdoc so I had to keep in mind if I was going to leave early I might damage that relationship for future students um, who could benefit and so like you really quickly you kind of see how the job hunt is a little bit beyond you um, but at the same time it needs to be is something you take very seriously, um, if that's helpful at all. Yeah, you kind of need, it sounds like you just need to be looking forward a lot mm -hmm. um, and prepared to kind of battle those uh, challenges as they come, I guess. Yes. And 
I really like the perspective of um, grad student looking versus postdoc because it feels like it feels like what you're saying is that postdoc it's basically a job like you're go it's it's not like you're doing a degree anymore like you're not yeah. literally not doing a degree anymore it should be treated as a job that you're already doing and um, the the extra levers that you can pull um, are just like any other job yeah um, so um, this next question, when we're talking about publications, um, how important are they? And can you elaborate on how important they are if you're, say, going, if you're wanting a job in academia or if you're considering going into industry or maybe another subset um, in between? Um, yeah. So how important yeah. are publications? And then elaborate further. Yes. Um, you know, so I never wanted to be uh, in academia, right, which is a very strange thing for, for someone with a PhD to say, I feel <laughs> like. Um, but I, I do know, at least again, this is this is STEM facing, but I think this is probably applicable. Like if you do want to become a professor, you know, publication record is, is critical. I don't think that status quo has really changed. I still think that job market is very competitive. And one people, one lever that people can pull to stand out, you know, is just like a rock star publication record. Um, I will say in an industry in some of these, you know, quote unquote, alternative careers, which I really like, hate that title <laughs> for scientists. I mean, these are all careers. There's nothing yeah. alternative about any of them. I would say if you want to be, you know, in industry, and I'm thinking at like, you know, large pharma, for example, it's not so cut and dry. I mean, so I had, you know, three peers um, in grad school. I had, I think, you know, seven publications. I had a postdoc. I had a good friend with zero publications. He got a job right away, mm -hmm. you know, in an industry, a very prestigious job. And then another uh, who had four or five publications also got a very prestigious job. And so like, you know, what does that say? You know, obviously you want publications. I think um, that's a statement that's always going to be evergreen. Do they gate getting a job? No unless you're diehard, like academic. Like if okay. you in your heart of hearts know that you wanna be a professor at a very like large reputable university, you're gonna to have to earn those publications and you're gonna to have to do the, you know, tried and true academic marathon, right? Yeah. I mean, you gotta stay in your PhD for a very long time. You gotta post that for a very long time. You gotta make your advisors very, very happy. Um, because, you know, that's the culture that you want to go into. And, you know, from what I've seen, the culture in, you know, large pharma, you know, industry, I sort of use those interchangeably, and then in the alternative careers is progressing so much more rapidly yeah. than in academia. For my current job, they did not even look at my publication record yeah. whatsoever. They don't even know if I have publications, um, because I just sent in um, a resume, not a CV. And yeah, um, it's, you know, I think today is a very exciting time to be a scientist. And I definitely encourage people to shake off sort of the shackles of, you know, needing a dozen publications to get a job. Um, you know, it really comes down to is a very polished job talk uh, where you give 30, 50 minute presentation on what you've done. Like if you can nail that, if you can really convince people you have problem solving skills, if you're an expert in your field, if you know the technical intricacies, you know, publications at that point are just icing on the cake. Absolutely. And I think we are um, heading into this new kind of age. So um, I, what I did is I have started my master's and I transferred up to PhD. So I've still kind of been like, I'm, I'm quite new to everything, but um, it feels I can really see that shift in changes in the importance in publications and um, versus the importance of like edu um, the science communication and education and kind of like outreach side is becoming more important. And it depends on what university you're at, of course, but um, I see a lot more professors kind of valuing those other skills, but what might be called like your soft skills or your technical skills, but to be able to present to someone and have your like hard and fast uh, 10 to 15 minute presentation and be a very good communicator to an audience. Um, you know, 
tons of people can work on a paper. Um, you might not have even written one full paragraph in that paper, honestly, once it's gone through all its edits, but to be able to pull together a presentation and communicate to an audience, I see a lot more people um, showing interest in that, um, specifically in my university and a few other universities uh, that I collaborate with and really valuing that. So that whole like publish or perish um, mindset is I think hopefully slowly decreasing um, in academia. Like of course the importance is all about what you can share to the world. So in the end, a lot of it will be will you will still have to put publications out there hopefully um to share your science but um i've seen a lot of negative um reactions from older scientists who did publish or perish in, in their days and seeing that shift they're like but i suffered now you need to suffer <laughs> it's like exactly. we're shifting everything's shifting <laughs> um and i also wanted to touch on something that you mentioned earlier about how depends on what kind of field you're getting into but like a master's might be too much a phd might be too much um i think it really depends on what field you're going into um because in geology um a master's is almost like overqualifying you if you're wanting to get like a field-based or exploration-based job um your master's phd definitely if you're doing postdoc you're almost like putting yourself into a position of academia where where I appears in chemistry, for example, who masters was like bare minimum that you could have. Um, and that definitely affects your job hunting and and kind of pigeonholing yourself or not pigeonholing yourself into what type of job that you can actually get. Right. Yeah. And, and hopefully if anyone listens to this and is kind of master PhD, I, I hope I don't give them anxiety <laughs> because yeah. absolutely to your point, like I know in engineering, like a master's is the pinnacle degree, yeah. you know, PhD and postdoc in engineering. And, and, you know, someone hopefully can correct me later if I'm wrong, but like, that's just too much. And then for a PhD, it really is. People think of it as bachelor or PhD. Yeah. Um, like I haven't seen a lot of people give value to a, to a master's um, but then again, like I've, I've had peers who've mastered out of their, their chemistry programs and then gotten very nice jobs, gotten the same job that you can get with a PhD. Yeah. So times they are changing. Times are changing <laughs> I, and it's, yeah. Um, so when you were job searching, did you run into any issues or problems um, in, in, in your endeavors? Yeah, I mean, so I, you know, hopefully my story can can help some people. So I was a grad student. I was a straight up overworked, right? And I was coming into lab seven days a week. Like I knew I was about to graduate. My PI, fortunately, is very, um, very good at getting his students out to the next step. Um, and so that, that was that was huge. I mean, I got out with my PhD. I didn't have to battle him. I didn't have to like chase him around the hallways for his signature. Um, you know, but the sort of counter to that was I was I think I worked 28 out of every 30 days or something oh like gosh. that um and yeah and that's just what you that was the puts and takes you get out early but you work a lot um and so he just sort of told me I was going to postdoc and you know my PI is a super busy guy like I was interested in the idea of a postdoc I obviously wanted to try and enter industry first like at least wanted to try an interview right you know, but it was still very much like this is my PI saying like this is going to be good for you just do it. Um, right. And I didn't know what the heck I was doing I didn't want to argue <laughs> with him and at the same time like this was a really good postdoc like who am I to say no. Um, I want to gamble put in front of you like right. yeah. <laughs> um, and so you know honestly like going back in time I. I don't think I've done anything different. I think I was in a very fortunate position, but some people would would have wanted to push back and say like, no, I actually don't want this. And then, you know, what you have to be ready for there is the chance that you don't land a job and that postdoc would have walked away. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I think I, I wish this country wasn't this way, but like a lot of success does come down to chance, right? Um, and so like, this was just a, uh, a point in the game of life where I could have gambled and said, Hey, no, actually I want to start my career. I don't want to do this postdoc. Um, but, but I took the postdoc and 
job hunting there was sort of a, it started as a comedy of errors because I didn't know what I was doing and I was sort of making a lot of mistakes. So uh, my strategy was to like show up, just kill it, like get something done as quickly as possible. Um, whether it be enough for like a patent or a publication or just like a couple of really nice slides for a job talk and then start job searching. I see. Um, and so that's what I did. Like my PI told me like, hey, this would be a successful postdoc. I asked it up front. Um, it took me about three months to do that. And then I told him, hey, I'm job hunting. And he got really upset, uh, understandably, because what I never did you know, day one, I asked them what would make this a successful postdoc. He told me I did it, but then we never had the conversation of like, what is your expectation of me? Right. Like of me, not of like, what's the next step in this project? Um, of course, he was very traditional. He wanted there two years and he fortunately knew I was, was job searching, but didn't treat me any differently. Oh, God. And I know that's not always the case. Um, and I'm trying to think of an example of one that would not be the case. And as I'm racking my memory, you now again, this is still some of like the, the teaching that I have in me of like postdocs, they have no power. Um, quite a lot of people as postdocs were sort of actively job searching and their PIs did not fire them. Their PIs did not like, treat them any differently. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's actually pretty encouraging as, as I remember this. Yeah, that's great because you think of any other career, <clears throat> if you're planning to leave the company or planning to leave your current job, like your, your supervisor, boss, anyone is going to be like, well, what do I owe you? Like, right. <laughs> like you're, you're planning to leave us. So what's the point? So that's very encouraging to hear that you had a good experience. And yeah. as you think about it more, other people did as well. Yeah. And I 100% do not recommend like flagging this around, right? You know, the fact <laughs> that you're, you're it like every right. day, <laughs> you know, it, you know, the fact that you're job hunting, like, I, I think just to have a candid single conversation with your PI about what you yep. want um that's that's critical i would not talk about this to your lab mates i did not talk about this to my lab mates no. um because certain labs are more competitive than others and you don't necessarily want to give you know this this information out is as much as it sucks as much as like i had lab mates they're also job hunting i'm like i just wasn't in a secure enough place to help yeah. you because this is a very competitive environment yeah and like if you go and tell my pi like that I'm leaving lab in the middle of the day to like go on interviews and stuff. I don't know what those repercussions are going to be. Correct. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, you know, doesn't make me feel good. Right. That's a lot of like slinking around. Um, but you know, that's, that's sort of what I had to do. And I shouldn't say slinking around. Um, no, but, but it, it is came... like kind of going, um, what may not be like commonly looked at as like, good to do maybe is going right. on a job interview halfway through your day um right yeah I mean just because yeah. because think of think of how taboo that is like I yeah. was always I was a morning person so I'd get up in the morning I would do my work before most people showed up into lab right most people showed up for me like nine or ten now I've, I've been there for five hours <laughs> at that point basically I would leave like 10 to 2 when everyone is sort of there it's so like optically you know yeah. I was in hot water um, but I think, you know, that is just something, you know, that the way I think about my postdoc, it was one third job hunting, two thirds actually postdocing. Okay. Um, and so it was sort of a, you know, a full-time job on top of it, but yeah, I think, you know, where people would get in hot water is if job hunting actually started to affect the quality of their work. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, you know, if, if you're able to, and it should certainly be the expectation for yourself, both as a grad student and as postdoc, like job hunting, it should not decrease the quality of what you're putting out because then your PI is going to care. Yes. And yeah. then your PI is going to start, um, you know, maybe micromanaging or, or being a little more intense. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I can kind of relate to that. 
um, when I came out telling my supervisors that I was planning to master out and, and quit my PhD program, they were like, okay, oh, panic like um what's the fastest way we can get you out and I'm like no I like I want to do quality work and I want to have a master's at the end they thought I was just going to quit completely um and I was like no I want to actually master out and and be able to have something to show for this so I think they were almost surprised that um me making this decision wasn't going to just say okay I'm completely done and just like job searching it shouldn't be like an all or nothing thing you have to kind of incorporate it into your life um mm -hmm. so I hear you say that uh you you weren't talking to your lab mates about this but who did you go to for support um did you have a support system around you other peers maybe or did you kind of stick to outside your school circle yeah absolutely and, and support system is just critical uh it can mean so many things to so many people i mean I'm, so I'm, <laughs> uh obviously you know i had some lab mates from grad school and a couple of these folks at this point were in industry right because they had gotten jobs when i had gone to post sex like them um i actually had a really a fairly easy time just messaging people on linkedin I yep. you know, found someone who like has like a, a title, you know, like a chemistry role at some company that I was interested in. You send them a message. And when I was in the Boston area, so it is a little privilege because it is such a biotech hub, but I was able to just go and get coffee with these people, chat about their jobs, build a network. Um, you know, from that, I kind of have like a, a long time mentor that has, has taught me a lot. And it's just because essentially a cold message on LinkedIn. And eventually you just find people who really want to help. Um, and one of the most, you know, positive things I can say about like, the scientific community, there's such a huge drive to pay it forward, you know, because almost everyone here went through grad school in some capacity. I think very few people actually enjoyed it. <laughs> and then, you know, so many people want, want to help and give back. Um, and so you can, you can certainly find that I, a huge advocate, I strongly recommend you know, reach out to people on LinkedIn, obviously have, you know, a number of questions for them. Um, just so the discussion isn't like, hey, you know, I'm in grad school, I don't really know what to do, can you help me? You know, then the person you reach out to is kind of, you know, what can they really do? But yeah. if you have like, hey, I see you're at, you know, company X, but you were in, you know, um, you know, this lab a couple of years ago, like, how is it transitioning? You know, what would you do differently? Uh, the sort of, you know, like directive questions like that can really help. Um, and then therapy, I think, you know, uh, just being able to, to talk to someone because like you, know, you get into such a such a place, at least to me, it's like, okay, I got to wake up, got to work, got a job on yeah. like your brain you know, is like, ah. <laughs> yeah, you sort of, you know, kind of forget that you're in your 20s. Yeah. <laughs> or at oh, least, gosh, you know, yeah. that's 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 yeah. when I was and like well I need to sort of calm down you know talk to a professional um and at least I know at the universities that I was at there was a couple of free counseling sessions um so I definitely recommend people check out their you know, local campus you know mental health institute uh whatever they name it because these things seem to be named a lot of things they're all different yeah yeah and then obviously I know a lot of students at least stateside have health insurance um so check that and then also check for um so uh therapy programs have like intern offices uh for the folks who are trying to like get their degrees in therapy okay. and you can usually have talk therapy with those um intern hours for at discounted prices because these are grad students in their own right yeah. Yeah. um you know training and that's where the reduced rate comes from so i know as a grad student for me as a postdoc even like trying to afford therapy on my salary was a choice okay. between that and, and groceries mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah and so so yeah some campuses do have free i would check out those um sort of therapist intern hours and then also what your insurance covers um yeah i mean yeah, talk I it out linkedin point, yeah. and then friends who are not in your lab yeah awesome i i really like that point of networking and i do want to get back to that point in just a few minutes um i want to talk a little bit more about the specifics of job hunting first mm -hmm. um because this is all about job hunting without your mentor support so you are battling this on your own probably for the most part um 
so okay so you found a job you've you've applied for it they ask for references the person who has been mentoring you for the last two, three years is your postdoc or, or is your postdoc supervisor or PI mentor of some sort. Do you ask them for a letter? Can you ask them for a letter? I mean, I guess if you've been open communication, they're probably expecting it, honestly. But uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I personally did not. You um, didn't? Okay. I did not ask my PI for a letter of recommendation. I think there's this couple of things to keep in mind. So, you know, in a non postdoc and non grad student world, like for me now, I have the right, if I were to be interviewing for another company, to ask them, do not contact my current employer. Mm. Um, and this right, for whatever reason, seems to be gone <laughs> in academia. At least that's what I was told, as all my peers are told, like your PI has absolute control <laughs> over like where you go and what you do. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know, because it's not like that anywhere else for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so what I did as a postdoc was I just used my PhD committee for my three okay. letters of reference. Um, you know, what do you do as a grad student when they ask you for letters of recognition? That is a little trickier. Um, I know some people have, um, like my committee was only three people. I know in some universities, committees are larger than three, so you might be able to pick three of those. But at the end of the day, like you know, someone, especially if you're going into academics, can ask your PI, like, hey, like, what's up with Dan? Yeah. <laughs> like, are they a good student? <laughs> like, and so, you know, that um, would need to be approached with a little, with just the conversation ahead of time. You want to tell your PI as a grad student, like, hey, um, there's going to be a request for a letter coming in. And what you can do then, like, I've heard horror stories of these people, like, because you know, I've heard horror stories of, of PIs getting a request for a letter and then just like with a Sharpie, they just write no and yeah. like send it. And I, I've never actually seen this happen. This is all hearsay. I don't think it bodes any PI well to trash talk their own student. I think it's a bluff. Yeah. Um, you know, that being said, I wouldn't put it past the PI to be like, you know, this student is middle of the road and then that can hurt your chances. And so one thing like, you know, the whole publisher parish, we talked about this earlier. I think it's important for grad students. It's critically important for the PIs because they're the ones perishing if they don't publish, not you. Yeah. Yeah. And you can sort of use that power dynamic to your advantage. You know, if your product is going well, like, hey, look, there's this letter um, that's gonna be coming in you know, by the way, I just got this really exciting results, you know, in the next couple of <laughs> weeks, I want this done. And it's, you set the stage like that. So you make them think like, oh, wow, this is a really good student. Yeah. Um, and it's totally okay. Also, as a grad student, you know, even if we have a result that's like three months old, if it's really exciting, if we haven't told anyone yet, I would honestly sit on it until you, 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 need, it. To, when you need to, to play it. this card, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's sort of like, a, you know, a game you might have to play. But yeah, I, you know, um, because, you know, my PI, both in, in grad school and um, postdoc, they'd always ask for updates like every day. And so if I had like a killer day when I learned a bunch of stuff, I wouldn't tell them everything right away. Right. You'd sort of space yeah. it out over time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, besides the point, but it, but it is a useful tactic to uh, sort of make your PI think that you're, you know, always doing something, which is, <laughs> yeah. of course, impossible. You know, nobody yes. can, you know, be a star student seven days a week. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you didn't ask your, your PI for a reference letter, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it um, if you have that good relationship with them too. Um, but of course, different for everyone. Um, how long did it take for you to find a job if you don't mind me asking slash um what's kind of like a general timeline of, of you find of anyone finding a job yeah and and so my timeline was not uh gated by needing a phd and you know that or the master's whatever terminal degree it is that you're going for um because then it gets a little complicated kind of way after your pi i think as a postdoc you have a lot more freedom Oh. Uh, that being said, you know, because the post like you can leave whenever. Yeah, I literally yeah. showed up into my PI's office, gave him my two weeks notice, um, 
and it, it, that was it. And you were out. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I think from the the time I sent in my first application to the time I actually like signed an offer, um, it was about eight months. Okay. I would say it was about eight months. Um, and a lot of, you know, a lot of um, applications, you're just never going to hear back. You're never going to hear a response. And that's kind of frustrating. Um, and then a lot of that was, you know, getting into like round one uh, interviews, round two interviews, but like not getting the offer. Um, and that's like tough and, and something to kind of like build up a stomach for. Um, sort of dealing with that rejection because at least I sort of felt like I was um, uh, not playing it safe, right? I mean, because I was going out and I, and I was yeah. networking with people like during lab hours, even though I was getting lab done, like all these optically things that people kind of side eyeing. Um, and I wasn't getting the results as quickly mm -hmm. as would have made me feel comfortable. So yeah, it can be harrowing, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's important to remember that everyone goes through it, um, and to to be prepared for for rejection because it will come. Yeah, <laughs> um, and within eight months, like that's that's probably a lot of different um, applications, interviews. Um, yes. I wouldn't be surprised if that even went longer for some people. Um, so okay, that's a that's a good timeline. I mean, I was, I I have no clue what the timeline was like. So yeah. that definitely puts it into perspective. Um, what did you do for like self care during those times? Um, you mentioned therapy. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's tough. I mean, going back in time, I wish I could have done more. <laughs> um, you know, I, I did have therapy about once a month again because budget concerns Expensive. yeah um you know I was super fortunate and not everyone gets this but I was able to take most weekends off while in postdoc right. taking weekends off in in grad school was not necessarily a, an option every weekend for me um and so you know do what do simple things play video games <laughs> um you know cook really big into baking um my fiance, fiance and I, sorry, were doing distance at that point. So she would come up on weekends. And that was okay. just great to see her. Okay. Um, yeah, because especially, I mean, I left uh, Nashville where the PhD was to go to Boston. Um, and then when you do that, I think one thing, a lot of PhD or students who move on to postdocs in new cities sort of don't take stock in is like how hard that can be to sort of leave your network behind. Yeah. Um, and so at least if I would have had known how hard that was going to be, I could have prepared myself a little bit better. Um, but that, that did sort of, that came with a shock. I got a cat. Um, <laughs> having a cat <laughs> helps a lot. Um, but yeah, I think just it's, it's, you know, for me, just cooking dinner for myself was a big deal. You know, being able to like, hey, like, I just I'm going to do this one thing today. It's going to be nice. And that's like a huge victory. Yeah, and it's also yeah. a huge victory that I don't have to work today. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, getting myself to a place where like, it's OK if I do one thing productive today yeah. um, was a really nice to sort of self-care mentality. Great. No, I love that. OK, before we wrap up, I really want to talk about networking because mm -hmm. I'm huge advocate for networking, but COVID times had made that very difficult. Um, conferences, at least in Canada, are kind of still not a thing. Um, I've heard about some conferences happening in person in the United States, but um, not a ton um, in my field that I'm in right now. So uh, what would you recommend um, as like, uh, as a networking um, pathway because you know you mentioned just like cold calling um on LinkedIn but like what else would there be for people looking for jobs outside of academia yeah I mean I would I like, guess never too late um to start building your like lateral network so your peers that you have now um I mean because these people can go off and do things <laughs> mm -hmm. um and so like you know that that's a really easy place to start I think just to reconnect with someone who you know 
maybe they're in your program, maybe they graduated just like a year or two ago, um, just reconnecting with them, asking how it's going. And then building up from there, there's a number of um, online uh, virtual career fairs and uh, recruiting events for, for big oh, companies. Wow. So I think, you know, again, this is a STEM uh, focused thing, but Massachusetts has the Massachusetts Biotechnology Council, and they do a ton of like online virtual career fairs and sort of like 40 minute seminars of like, what is this industry um, geared towards, towards job searchers. And every state uh, has their own biotechnology council or something similar. Okay. And yeah, just going to, to that venue virtually could be really helpful. Um, and even if you don't live in Massachusetts, you can still virtually attend these events. Okay, that's really um, and cool. So I, yeah, so, so I bring that up because I don't, you know, the, the way life sciences is set up in the states, it's localized in certain places on the coasts. Um, and Boston is huge and the Massachusetts uh, Biotechnology Council or Mass Bio for short has a ton of good resources and it's, uh, most of them are, are free. Um, the only ones that aren't free are these like weekend long intensive courses, but um, yeah. And then some, uh, you know, one career that a lot of advanced degree folks think about is consulting. And the really big consulting firms will have a ton of virtual recruiting events because the hiring process for these um, like cream of the crop consulting firms, it's very um, paved. <laughs> it's very structured. It's like taking the ECT all over again. Okay. Um, it's very much like a standardized exam. And they have seminars about what is consulting, you know, how do you, you know, prep and pass the standardized exam. And yeah, so, so I would, you know, again, sorry for rambling. I would encourage people to check out their like local biotechnology council state sites. Um, if one does not exist, you can check out MassBio. And then if you have like an industry, you can sort of ask around like, you know, who is like a good consultancy? Who's a good pharma company to be an MSL for? Who's a good, you know, pharma company to, to be a, like a discovery scientist. And then if you go to those companies' pages, more often than not, they're gonna have recruiting information okay. um, that can be helpful to read. And yeah. One thing I remember about conferences is I um, was always seeing the same faces. You recognize the same faces mm -hmm. all the time. One thing that now with COVID times and everything being online is I'm really recognizing names a lot more. And it's nice to put faces to names um, that you often see it at the conferences and now you're seeing them online and you see all these names but even like you attend one web webinar seminar um, and you see the same person coming all the time you know that's maybe someone good to connect with um, even just sending them you know cold cold messaging them on LinkedIn and saying hey I noticed you attend these webinars like you work for this company you know do you have an affiliation with this with this council or um, organization because I, I, I really enjoy taking in like webinars and mm -hmm. uh, local conferences because that's where you're going to kind of be meeting people who will hopefully kind of take you on that journey moving forward. Yeah. Um, um, and conferences is a great point. I totally forgot that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, 100% agree. Yeah. Conferences are different at this time in our lives now though. So students are definitely <laughs> grad students, undergrad students, everyone is is definitely taking them, them in differently and getting very different things out of them than they used to, I think. Um, okay, Dan, before we finish up, is there anything else you'd like to mention or talk about um, that that you, we didn't get to today? Yeah, I, I definitely, you know, uh, what can I recap here? <laughs> um, it's certainly okay to, to be very stressed about this, I think. Um, I mean, I was because, you know, my, my PI during my postdoc would have been totally content if I stayed there for life. Um, and so like I had to do something to sort of get up because it's not what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, just taking, you know, the, the time out of the day, you know, taking that energy to, to network. Um, and then in that eight months from when I sort of first started applying 
to getting the job, but also changed careers for all intents and purposes, right? You know, I'm no longer doing chemistry um, in a business development role. So that basically means, you know, learning about new, uh, you know, drugs and development, and then trying to determine like, are these going to be successful or not? Um, and so a huge shift in, in skill set um, that I was able to do because I found a really good mentor who taught me <laughs> um, yeah. during that COVID lockdown. So you know, a lot of it, you know, it, it's really those those conversations. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll sort of end it on this. Like in investment banking, you know, they take 100 calls a day because you never know which one is going to be important, um, sort of like this analogy. And I think that's that's true for, for job searching as a grad student, like just have as many conversations as you can, because you really don't know which one is going to lead into something cool. Um, and so I would definitely encourage people to like send that LinkedIn mail, you know, attend that conference, you know, go grab that coffee, catch up with that old friend, you know, ask a question, um, because most of them are just going to be fizzled out, but you really never know. Uh, which one is going to lead into like a, a lifelong sort of mentor or job opportunity. Um, and so, yeah, you know, things kind of manifest in mysterious ways. Um, PhDs, postdocs, like there's a lot more power that you have uh, than we're taught. Um, and yeah, keep that in mind. Yeah, we encourage you to use that power. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, all right, well, this has been Grad Chat by PhD Balance. Our episodes are now posted simultaneously on our podcast and YouTube channel on Saturdays at 3 p.m. Eastern. To find our podcast episodes, just search Grad Chat on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can connect with us um, with PhD Balance on our website at phdbalance.com or on social media on Twitter and Instagram at phd underscore balance. Until next time. Bye and take care of yourself.